<clears throat> I'm Gary. I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I'm uh, sober by the grace of God in the 12 steps of AA, and I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, and it's a real honor to be asked to uh, share at the uh, convention here locally. Um, I want to thank the convention committee for asking me. I'm really humbled, and it's quite a privilege. And um, I'm really nervous. <laughs> My first sponsor told me uh, that's just God shaking the truth out of you. You don't have to shake this hard, okay? <laughs> you know, my, my sobriety date's July 9, 1991, and, and when I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, we used to have a lot of shakers, you know? And if you ever had to get to see that or experience that, you may get that visual today when I share. Uh, so, um, look, honey, I got all the ribbons. <laughs> I feel like I won the cow milking contest at the <laughs> Iowa State Fair. It just proves I've got the best daughter in town. And uh, if your home group isn't the best home group in the world, don't change home groups. Just get more active and make it the best home group in the world. Um, as I said, my sobriety date is July 9, 1991. I don't tell you that to impress you. It doesn't impress me. Um, after all, I drank for 25 years, and I did a bunch of other party favors, and uh, I'm only sober for 12. I have a lot more experience uh, drinking than I do staying sober. But I was taught that I need to share my sobriety dates so that people know the program works. And that was important to me when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, to hear people announce their sobriety dates. Um, I was also taught not to announce a sobriety date I haven't earned. And I learned that the hard way. I, was at the, I got sober at the workshop on Central Avenue, and I shared in the meeting that I was coming up on nine months Friday. And uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have three forms of communication, you know, telephone, cell phone, and tell AA. You know, that's the third greatest communication in the world. And uh, my sponsor got wind of that. And he explained to me we don't take credit for things we haven't earned. And, uh, you know, I had a towering ego as it was, and, uh, you know, I need to remember that this is a day at a time program. It's not a month at a time. It's not a year at a time. And if I start counting the months and the years, I'll forget about the day at a time, and I won't be here. And I need to be here because AA saved my life. AA saved my life, um, not only gave me sobriety, restored me to sanity, and has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. Um, and it's hard for me to express the gratitude of what this program has done for me through 12 simple steps. Um, I was a broken person when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had lost my dignity as a man. And on top of all the other things I had lost, I had lost my dignity as a man. And I have that back today. And, and that's one of the many, many blessings that I have been given as a member of this fellowship and I will be forever grateful. Um, my dad was a hard drinker. Uh, my mom uh, had a Valium deficiency. Um, I got one brother, older brother, and um, you may have noticed I'm a little taller than everybody, and uh, I sort of grew up uh, you know, in school uh, being teased a lot by people in school because of my height. Actually, my kindergarten picture I'm, I'm standing right next to the kindergarten teacher, and I'm as tall as a kindergarten teacher, and, the, and uh, it's, it's, it's unique. Um, so uh, I knew right away that you know, I was different. I was taller than everybody. And um, at my house, um, the way I was brought up is uh, boys don't cry. Um, that's enough out of you, young man. And uh, if you want to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. And uh, I remembered learning how to stuff my feelings. I was about eight years old at the dentist. And uh, my dad took me, and he looked over at me, and he goes, you're not scared, are you? And I was terrified. I wasn't scared. I was terrified. But I knew that he didn't want to hear that. And I said, no, Dad, I'm not scared. And he goes, good. And that was important to me because I got the acceptance of my father. I told him exactly what he wanted to hear because I needed that acceptance from him. And, and that lesson, looking back, taught me to not share how I was feeling. 
And um, I did that all my life. I did that all my life. And, and I've done that at times in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we're human. But uh, I've learned today that I can trust people in these rooms. And I can allow myself the uh, humanity that we all possess, but I can share with another person. I think sometimes we get time in the program, and uh, at times I've been, sh I've been less than honest with others because I don't want them to really know what's going on with me. You know, I, get, I start worrying about my AA image. And uh, I, I have to watch myself and be on guard for that. Um, it's not important what people think. It's for me, it's more important that I be honest today. That's what's important today. Um, so, anyways, um, at 13 was my first time I drank. And I loved it. I love drinking. Oh, boy, do I love drinking. Every, yeah, I love alcohol. I like fl any flavor. It, it works for me. It just works. Every, it's all good. It's all good. And, um, and I, like to get, I like to get drunk. I want to be blasted. I want to get crushed. I want an out-of-body experience. I mean, when I drink, that's what's going to happen. And um, that's how I drink. That's how I, as a matter of fact, I don't understand why you would drink any other way. I get so frustrated when I'm with people that are, quote, social drinkers. You know, I, I'll be out with a client and, you know, the guy will order a drink and then they, they sip it and, and they leave it and they ignore it. They're not paying attention to their drinking. <laughs> and um, it's frustrating for me. And I'm sitting there going, well, is there something wrong with it? Is it, he'll make you another. If it's not right, just ask him. And then they commit the, they commit the ultimate sin if you're a person like me. They let the ice melt in their drink. Okay, that's my definition of alcohol abuse. Um, so, so at 13, I'm drinking, and um, at 16, I skip my final year of high school and graduate. Uh, I went to night school at East High School to graduate and end up going to New York University. And at 20, I uh, graduate with honors, and at 21, I get my master's. And um, I got a degree, but I did not get an education because I, well, two, a couple things happened there. The first thing that happened was um, I thought my parents were the problem. If I just got away from my parents, that would solve the problem. And what we learn in AA is where, wherever you go, there you are. And there I was. You know, I took Gary with me to New York. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know I was that bad in, in uh, college. I was sharing with my first sponsor. You know, I used to chase buses down Broadway when I drank. I would drink in my room, and then I would take the elevator down, and I would wait for the bus, and I would just chase it for blocks and blocks to the point where the bus driver would wave. And when I came in AA, my sponsor says, you know, social drinkers don't chase buses. <laughs> and that was sort of a revelation, like, wow, that's pretty impressive. So anyways, I had all my degrees, and I was ready to, you know, I was uh, top of the world. I was going to conquer Wall Street. And um, I got hired by a firm that had been in business for 125 years. And um, I remember at the end of the week, I was out with a couple friends at a bar. What a surprise. And uh, I was sharing with them how it was so unbelievable to me that these people were in business as long as they had been in business because they had absolutely no clue what they were doing. <laughs> I mean, thank God I showed up because it was patently obvious they were about to go under. Um, what happened is I pointed that out to them, that they had significant internal problems, and uh, they pointed out to me the door and where I could uh, find it. And, uh, and, and then my pride got in the way. I could, tell any, I could never admit to you I got fired from a job. Never, ever. I would say I lost the job. It's like I showed up one day, they moved the whole operation, I don't know where they went, I lost it, they're gone, who knows. So, um, and, and, and what happened was I kept losing jobs. I kept losing them. And so I came back to Rochester with my tail between my legs. And uh, I was living uh, the La Vida Loco. I was living on Smith Street in a furnished uh, studio apartment behind Nick Tahoe's, which one of my sponsees calls the Ghetto Fabulous. And um, <laughs> I, uh, I was drinking a lot, and I was struggling a lot. And uh, this is how bad I had become. I, you know, when you drink, you tend not to pay attention to all the other little things you need to do, like bathe 
or like clean your apartment. But every now and then, you know, even a blind squirrel gets a chestnut every now and then. And I, I would convince some woman that she might want to come over to my place. And uh, this girl was coming over and, you know, I knew enough that women tend to want to check out a guy's bathroom for some reason. That's important to them. And I had never once since I had lived there cleaned the bathtub. And, uh, you know, I, I, we are a baffled lot. You know, I didn't know what to do. But all of a sudden, you know, that thought came to me and I ran to the hardware store and I got home with white spray enamel paint and I spray painted the bathtub. You, you laugh, but it worked. Um, so, uh, that's, that's a true story and uh, we can laugh about that today. Um, I, st I decided to start my own business because I had a reputation because any time I went for an interview they would check your references and <laughs> people said you don't want that guy. So I, you know, I, there was no, nothing else for me to do. And through some uh, hard work and some real blessings and some uh, luck, um, I, I started a business that became wildly successful. And um, I made more money than I ever deserved. I was given more gifts and opportunities in my life. I, I, I mean, I, 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 was, I had everything you were supposed to have. Um, I had the big house in Pittsburgh. I had the cars. I had the country club membership. And I, I, I came from a poor family, so it was my idea that if I looked good on the outside, everything would be okay. I thought that everything was based on what car I drove, what house I had, how much was in the bank, what jewelry, whatever. And I didn't learn until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous that happiness is an inside job, and it's got to come from within. Um, those things are nice to have, but I spent my entire life uh, loving things that were things. You know, I didn't know how to love people. I just loved things, and um, things can't love you back. And my priorities were messed up. And what AA has taught me is that, you know, I need to get spiritually fit and, um, because I have a soul sickness. And, and that's a blessing here because I chased it for a long time because I lived my entire life. And my motto should have been, you know, there was never enough. There was a never, no matter what it was, there was never enough. If it was a car, I needed a bigger car. I needed a faster car. If it was a house, I needed a bigger house. I had to have more toys in it. Uh, the girlfriend, it, she, you know, she was wrong. It was blonde. I needed brunette. It didn't really matter. There was just never enough. And when it came to my drinking, there was never enough. You know, I drank like they were going to stop making the stuff at this point. Um, so I'm going to the bars and I'm drinking a lot. And you know, we all have our bartenders. You know, our favorite bartenders, um, who I decided I really thought they were more like flight attendants for me because drinking became a form of time travel. Um, see, my drinking was I would drink. And then I'd end up like two towns over, but I'm not really, I don't remember that transfer. And I don't remember, I didn't remember how I got home. You know, a lot of times um, I'd get home, but in the morning the car wasn't there. You know, now I, in sobriety, I will admit to all of you, I have lost my car keys. You know, that's, it's happened, I lose my car keys. But losing two tons of steel is not an easy thing to misplace. It's a big object. And uh, that happened to me. So, um, and it proceeded to get worse. It proceeded to get worse. Um, I was drinking more. I was blacking out. <clears throat> One day, I'm, I'm, I'm home. Sheriffs come to the door. That's never a good thing in the morning. And, um, and the bad part is I have no idea because I don't remember the night before. And they say to me, Gary, there's been a lot of vandalism in the neighborhood. And uh, so there was a bunch of lawn jobs and mailboxes taken out. And <laughs> Here's our card, and you call us if you see anything in the neighborhood. Now, I am hung over to beat the band. I'm thinking, okay, all right, fine. Shut the door, and then once again, uh, the light bulb went off. And so I, open, I go down to the garage, open the garage. There's one of my cars. I got bushes in the bumper. I got dirt. I mean, it looked like I was in a demolition derby with the car. And, um, and you know, and we can all laugh about it, but it's by, it's by God's grace I didn't kill somebody. It's by God's grace. I used to think I'm a better driver when I drink. I used to actually believe that. And when people talked about drinking and driving, when I came into AA, I thought they meant you go to a bar, you drink, and then you drive. 
I never left home without it. Why wouldn't you bring it with you into the car and drinking while you're driving? Why, what, it made no sense to me. You can do both. And that's what I did. I would drink and drive. That just worked for me. So things went on and it progressed. And, um, you know, I, I went through it all. I got the wife. And uh, I figured that was a solution. To my, that'll calm me down because I knew things were careening out of control. And, but, you know, you're not going to go to church and, and find some teetotaling person to marry. You know, I'm going to marry someone that drinks like, like I drank. If you didn't drink like me, I really didn't want to be around you. And, um, you know, we got married, and she immediately was on me about my drinking. She became pregnant, you know. And, I mean, I worked hard. I brought home a lot of money. I provided a good house. And, you know, she, she'd be sitting there at the dining room table, and she'd say, you know, that's your third beer. I go, listen, you know, why don't you just, you know, just don't worry what I'm doing and finish your breakfast. You know, it didn't matter, <laughs> you know. You know, so this is how it went. This is how it went for us. And um, what happened was is that she became pregnant and she put herself on her own without any encouragement by me, believe me, into an outpatient program and she stopped drinking. And that was the beginning of the end for me because I, I was living in, I wasn't about to stop drinking and um, so I had to start sneaking my drinking and hiding my drinking. And um, I used to play this hit and run thing. I'd come home, I'd been drinking. She'd have the audacity to accuse me of drinking. And I'd, how dare you? And I would just leave and go drink more. Um, and uh, that's just how it was. And my behavior, I started to treat her very badly. And, and I harmed her very badly. And we lost that baby. We had a stillborn in seven months. And um, that was the, uh, pretty much the end for us because I just went right off deep end. And, and what do I do when I'm in pain, when I'm in a lot of pain, I want to medicate because that's what alcohol does for me. Alcohol allows me to uh, feel other than how I'm feeling. And I don't like to feel pain. I don't do well with sadness. I don't do well with hurt. I do well with medication and I want to medicate it, I want to be numb. I don't want to feel anything. And um, for me, alcohol was liquid courage. Alcohol did for me what I couldn't do for myself. I can't tell you how many business situations involved alcohol, and it always made me feel okay. It made me feel not less than, because I'm the type of guy that if you treat me special, I feel average, and if you treat me average, I feel rejected. And alcohol changed all of that. I mean, I had a very strange phenomenon happen to me. I would go to a bar where I didn't know any, anybody, and I would feel very out of place. And after a couple hours, I would feel like I knew everybody all my life, and I fit right in. But then a curious thing happened. An hour later, I would be looking down on these people saying, my God, what am I doing drinking with these people? You know, they really have problems, you know? And I'd leave the bar. And that was a progressive thing for me. So anyways, my wife left, and, uh, which my first sponsor told me, good, she's a smart woman. And um, I ended up, a, a, it took me another three years before I found these rooms. And I didn't come in Alcoholics Anonymous because I wanted to. I ended up going on a one-hour chase through two counties with the police at very high speeds. And the sad part of that was is that um, I'm driving in neighborhoods where kids are playing. And I had become so cold-hearted that I wasn't about to stop if there were kids on the street. There was no way. And that's the type of despicable, disgusting human being I had become. And eventually that just ended out in Bergen. And I remember I was uh, down in the uh, bullpen downtown, which is the holding cell. And I had two felonies, three misdemeanors, and 19 traffic charges. And I said, my god, I've got to stop driving. And. Um, <laughs> Because it, you know, it just never made sense that I had a, a drinking problem. I knew I had a driving problem. You know, prior to that, I had totaled two automobiles, totaled them within a period of six months. And um, the insurance company wrote me a letter and said, we are canceling your insurance due to too many accidents. And that took me right off the hook. I said, that's the problem. I'm accident prone. You know, that's my problem. <laughs> you know? And that's how always it was for me. And anyways, that, that is when, that was the day of my sobriety. It was July 9th, 1991. That's where I went to jail. I was in jail for six months. I detoxed in jail. I don't suggest it. 
I saw snakes come. I saw snakes coming out of my arms and spiders crawling on my chest. I guess the best way I could describe it was a, a, a bad uh, acid trip, you know. And um, I ended up out in the Monroe County Jail, and these guys came in from Alcoholics Anonymous. And we had one meeting a week, and now there's nine pods where they can come in. And we had one meeting a week, and they ended up coming into our pod. Ours wasn't an alcohol pod. They didn't have any um, treatment pods out there like we have now. It picked up my pod. So that was my first God moment that I didn't realize was a God moment. And these guys showed up every week, and I was convinced, what a bunch of losers. How lame is this? See, because when you're in jail, all you want to do is get out of jail. So the idea that people that are not in jail coming into the jail means they are absolutely, they have no life at all, okay? <laughs> they may not be drinking, but I was having a lot more fun than they were, let me tell you. And, uh, you know, they showed up and they carried, and I, I was impressed. The same guy showed up every week. It just impressed me. And um, so when I got out after six months, I wasn't planning, um, well, I had my plan, um, but my higher power at the, po at the time, Judge Bristol, had his plan. <laughs> and uh, I ended up in a men's shelter on Joseph Avenue. And um, I was there for nine months. And I was mandated to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I came in out of compliance. I didn't come in because I wanted to be here. And it was awful because I was going to these meetings every day to get this piece of paper signed, and it was awful. You know, um, because everything gets better when you're, when, when you're not drinking and not working the steps. Your resentments get better. You know, you become rageful. You know, the fear turns into terror. I wanted to kill everybody, you know. You were the problem. I was never suicidal. I was homicidal. If you'd all die, I'd be fine. And um, so I'd go to the workshop and I'd sit. I got sober at the workshop on Central Avenue. I'm a workshop baby. And I'd sit in the last row. And I would sit there and take everyone's inventory. And that's what I would do. I would just take your inventory, and he's doing that, and he's doing that, and I know what he's doing, and he's lying, and, you know, and um, that's how it was for me. And I was suffering from untreated alcoholism. And that's the worst thing if you're a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I wasn't drinking, so that's the only requirement for membership. Thank God that's the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. And, um, because I, the way I treated my alcoholism was with alcohol. You know, that's how I treated it. And when you take the alcohol away, you ha there's a huge void. There's a vacuum that needs to be replaced with something. And um, I was working step none. And the benefit of step none is nothing. And that's the results I was getting. I was getting no results at all. And I was miserable. I was miserable. And um, so I broke down and got a sponsor. And they said, uh, you know, get someone who has what you want, because I didn't know what a sponsor was. Well, there was a guy with a Lincoln Town Car, and I needed that. And um, <laughs> I knew if I got that, I'd get the girl, if I had the town car. Well, as I asked him to be my sponsor, and, he, and uh, he didn't offer to loan me his car. And I didn't know he had 25 years in the program. And he asked me to mop the floor after the meeting. And I was like, my god. He obviously doesn't know who he's dealing with. <laughs> I'm new here. I don't mop floors, okay? Mopping is not my thing. And I tried to explain this to him, and he just said, mop the floor after the meeting. So I'd mop it with this huge resentment, you know, and um, eventually, you know, um, it got worse. I got worse. I started cleaning ashtrays. And because uh, all the me most of the meetings were smoking, and I'm the ashtray cleaner, some guy has two cigarettes going at the same time in two different ashtrays. <laughs> so I point out to him during the meeting in a very nice way that I thought that was fairly disrespectful. I have to clean these. Well, he gave me this hand gesture back, so it only seemed to make sense to tackle him right out of his chair during the meeting. Well, guess what? My sponsor found out, and uh, <laughs> he started talking about these traditions. Now, my attitude towards the traditions was, why are we reading these? It's slowing up the meeting. You know, we can cut a lot of this reading stuff out here, all right? This tradition things, what a, this isn't working for me. And he explained about our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity in that we don't start fist fights in the middle of a meeting. That's not what we do. And uh, so he started talking to me more about the traditions. Anyways, 
I'm work I, I was on the first step for six months, and let me just say this because I hear all sorts of different things. My sponsor said, regular people I sponsor can get this down in a few weeks. He goes, but smart Alex like you, you know, that's not the word he used, um, it usually takes a long time. Because, see, I was convinced I wasn't an alcoholic. I did not have alcoholism, you know. I had a few setbacks, um, you know. I had lost the wife, I would lost the business, I would lost the home, lost my friends. Family wasn't talking to me anymore. You know, just, these were some setbacks, you know. Nothing. I'm living in a homeless shelter, but I'm getting $49 a month from the county, and you know, so there's something. And um, <laughs> and I was convinced I could fix this. And um, until I got the ABCs of Alcoholics Anonymous, that you know, we we were alcoholics and could not manage our own lives. Probably no human power could relieve our alcoholism and that God could and would if he were sought. I wasn't going anywhere. And I couldn't get the B and C of it because I suffer a disease of denial. My disease tells me you're not that bad. It's going to be different next time. And you learned your lesson. And that's what my disease was telling me on a daily basis. I'm just not that bad because I would, I would compare. Not, I wouldn't try to relate. I'd come in here, I hear people that went to prison. Well, I haven't gone to prison. If I ever get that bad, I'll probably come in here and take it serious. And until I could get past the idea that no human power, I was powerless. Lack of power was my dilemma. I was absent power. I was without power. I needed to find some power. And it couldn't be human power because that wasn't going to work. And that I had to give that up. And see, my idea of powerlessness meant the way I was brought up by my father is that you're a coward and a weakling, you know, and that's not what it's about at all. It just comes when it comes to alcohol. When I pick it up, I cannot predict with certainty what's going to happen. But the way I was living my life, I was suffering worse and worse consequences, and I was harming more and more people. I was so selfish and self-centered when I got in here, I thought my drinking was my business, and if I want to drink, leave me alone, it's my business. I never realized till I got sober all the people I had harmed and all the lives I had touched in a negative and hurtful way as a result of that. And so I did get the first step down and I had a real problem with God. God was a real problem for me. It's not that I didn't believe in God, I believed in a punishing, vengeful God. God was out to get me. And it's because I was closed minded. Because I, I had the 911 God. I had the emergency God. I had the God get me out of this one. And I remember when the cops were pulling me through the window, um, when the chase ended, which I thought they were a little bit overreacting. But when they did that, I remember you know, praying, God, get me out of this one. And looking back, that was probably the best day of my life. Because God did get, get me out of that one. Because jail's like adult time out. And that was the only way I was going to stop drinking. You know, when you're a little kid, you sit in the corner. When you're an adult, you sit in jail. And um, <laughs> it was adult time out for me. I needed that time out because there was no other way I was going to stop. There was no other way I was going to stop. And, and so when I shared this with my sponsor, you know, he told me that I just had to become willing to believe. And I was convinced on page 47 of the big book, it doesn't say that. It says, you know, when, when you believe in God, you're well on your way. That's what I thought it says. And it doesn't say that. It says if, you know, if you believe in a higher power or, 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 become, or you can become willing to believe. And I needed to pray for the willingness to be willing. But here's what happened. I had a sponsor who I love very much. And one of the reasons I asked him to sponsor me is he had a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face. And he had been sober a long, long time. And I knew his story, and his story was a lot worse than my story. And um, I knew something. He believed very deeply. And so I sort of believed in him because he believed. And he made me believe in God. And thank God he did. And it took time. It took a long, long time. Um, when I got to the third step, um, the problem I had was the trust issue with God about I'm, I'm a control freak, I want to control the outcome with everything. And all the third step to me was, is okay, I've made this decision. And he explained to me, you really haven't done anything because you haven't done the rest of the steps. But he did talk to me a little bit about free will. And what he explained to me was, is that God gives each and every one of us free will. And we can do good things with it or we can do bad things with it. 
God would never take that gift back away from me once he's given it to me. So if somebody does terrible things, that's just they're using their free will in a bad manner. And we have that choice, and that's our choice. And that, that's going to come back in here very soon, and that was a very important part of my sobriety. Um, you know, the, the, when I got to my fourth and fifth steps, and it took me, I was think, 15 months over before I would do them, and he just said, well, now we're going to do those. The problem was my thinking. My thinking was so, so distorted. Um, my problem, it says, you know, it says on page 23, our problem centers mainly in our mind. And I was out of my mind, and all my thoughts were, um, you were the problem. Um, I had lots of fears, lots, and I didn't have resentments. I mean, I had some rage and hate and just awful, terrible things. And um, I got through those. I got through those. And um, it, it revealed to me that I needed to straighten up my thinking, and I was able to do that. And um, I got to six and seven, and nothing had changed. I mean, my life was getting better. I was out of the homeless shelter, and I got my first job, and I was making seven fifty an hour. And, and, and God has a great sense of humor. I ended up working for a company that used to work for me when I had my company. And so that was a lot of um, humble pie that I got fed. And I remember I told my sponsor I wanted to start my own business, and he said, you know what, you don't, know, you don't play well with others. You have to learn how to work with others sober. Because the only way you got by was uh, because um, of your drinking. Because my attitude with my employees were, you know, if you had to work with these idiots and morons, you'd be drinking after work every night too. You know, that was just my attitude about it, you know. Um, so I did those, and I got to six and seven, and this is what's going on. I'm, I'm three years sober. I'm driving like a maniac. I'm getting speeding tickets. I'm flying, and I mean, I'm making 750 an hour. I can well afford speeding tickets, right? <laughs> right, right. But what's the solution to my problem? We just put the car insurance in someone else's name. Register the car in someone else's name. And that's what I did. Um, so I'm driving like a maniac. You know, I think they should have Gary's Lane. You know, that left lane, they should just have a sign, that's Gary's Lane, and you all drive over here because Gary needs that lane. You know, because I'm a very important person. Uh, I might have just come up with the solution to Middle East peace, get out of my way, because I need to get, get going here. Um, I'm at the Wegmans line. I'm in the seven item line. I'm counting the items in front of me. The woman's got 10. It says cash only. She's writing a check. I'm out of my mind. I am just out of my mind. Now, the good news is, is I have this whole thing happen up here. You know, I'm thinking, I, you know, you think all the things you're going to do. I don't do them, but I am just so restless, irritable, and discontented. And I'm in the program. I'm sober. Um, and this is what, so I call my sponsor, and he says, all right, great. Pick me up in a half hour. We'll go over to the Park Ridge men's meeting. You know, and you know, and I'm thinking, all right, so I do that. So I'm calling him up. I'm telling him what these people are doing to me. He goes, all right, great. Pick me up in a half hour. We'll go over to the jail meeting. I'm thinking, my God, I know he's old now. He's going deaf. You know, he's <laughs> just, there, what's there something wrong here? You know, because I was just obsessed with me. I was just so selfish and self-centered. And see, I suffer from the bondage of self. It's my bondage that's killing me. And my will, when it's self-will, it's dishonest. It's self-seeking, and it's resentful. And when I'm doing God's will, it's honest, it's giving, and it's forgiving. And I struggle mightily with some of those sometimes. And so um, a tragedy strikes. Uh, my sponsor was a landlord, and um, he uh, got jumped and robbed for $8. And uh, they beat him really bad, two guys. And uh, I'm at St. Mary's, and uh, this is back in the day, and uh, I had taken him to the Sunday meeting. There used to be a Sunday AA meeting at St. Mary's Hospital. And I wheeled him down there, and he, was, he just wanted to go to a meeting. That's all he cared about. He's all black and blue, and he's burst. The next day, I go up to see him for lunch, and while I'm there, a blood clot breaks off from his leg, goes into his heart, and he dies before my eyes. And... Um, That man did so much for me, and yet I was just full of rage. I just wanted these guys to just, I had all sorts of terrible things I wanted to do to them. So I'm at the wake, 
and uh, a guy I met at the academy group comes, <laughs> comes into the room, he's dressed like out of the Sopranos. He's got the long trench coat on, he's got the black suit, he, well, he probably doesn't remember, he had a black tie and a black uh, shirt, and, you know, and he's got the hat. And he comes over to me and he said, uh, how you doing? I said, you know, I'm not doing well. And he goes, you know, you are like the luckiest guy. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, don't you understand God put that man in your path when you needed him the most? <laughs> and that was really important to me. <laughs> and he, he, he <sighs> breathe, Gary. He gave me his number, and <laughs> he's been my sponsor ever since. And he's a totally different sponsor. And what happened after that, you know, I'm in mourning and I'm in grieving. And he said, why don't we grab a sandwich over at Midtown Plaza? And I show up and my sponsor just passed away. And, uh, you know, I'm expecting a lot of sympathy. And uh, <laughs> the first thing he says to me is, he, he first thing he says to me, you know, if you're going to be in business, you have to dress a little bit better than you're dressed. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay. And then the next thing he says, what step are you on? I go, listen, I'm grieving. You, you're not paying attention here. I'm grieving. And he said, I said the A step, and he said, well, you know, I think we need to get moving here. You know, why don't you finish that list up this week, and we'll meet next week for lunch, and we'll, we'll talk about that ninth step. And I'm thinking, oh, no, this isn't good. And here's why it wasn't good. I was living a phony life. I was being a total phony in AA. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, I was working the steps, I was staying sober, and the, my first sponsor taught me that service work keeps us sober, and I was very active in service work. He took me to a treatment meeting every week. He introduced me to the jail meetings at Monroe County Jail. Um, and at, looking back, the reason he had me doing things with others was to just get out of my own way, because I, I am the problem today. I am the problem today. And, um, but the reason I was being dishonest was, I, you know, the car insurance is in someone else's name. The registration's in someone else's name. I've got my rg and &E is in someone else's name. The phone company's in someone else's name. I've got no bank accounts, you know. And I'm trying to explain this to him when we sit down for our ninth step is like I don't really exist in the eyes of the government because, well, I owe him maybe $180,000. And, uh, okay. And what about the other things? Well, I might owe R&G a couple thousand, and um, I owed the phone company a couple thousand, and I also stole from a client for about $30,000. And see, my attitude with the services was, with, like R&G, &E, I already got that service, okay? I'll pay for a new service, but, you know, I paid some of the old bills, so they should magically forgive it, you know? Come on. And um, that just, you know, wasn't going to cut it with him. And... Um, so I wasn't making a lot of money. The business had started, but, uh, and also um, I owed a big amends to my family. So I, uh, I didn't want to go deal with the IRS, and he, he offered to go with me, and I, I went to the IRS. And uh, that got paid off. That got paid off like two years ago. Just by working this program, I, I paid that off. As a matter of fact, the last payment they called and they waived it. They just couldn't believe that I paid it off, and they said, you know what, you're all done. And, uh, and the funny part of that is one time I came home and I was on the payment plan. I'd worked out with them and a letter had come in the mail. And my wife sees it and opens it and it says, I owe the IRS maybe $178,000. Well, she sees this and like, she's like, oh my God. I go, oh, honey, it can't be more than 175. I mean, don't worry about it, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I've made all those other amends. And I made the amend, it was funny about the, the client. Um, I, del I, I delivered that check in person on the first of the month every month for 30 months, 1000 a month. And, um, and I wasn't making a lot of money. Um, but that's what I did. I, I first wanted to do it by phone, you know. And, you know, I said, well, did you harm them by phone? You know, how are you going to make the amends by phone? <laughs> um, but the problem was, see, I had to clean up my side of the street because I wasn't sleeping well. I was restless, irritable, and discontented. 
I, was ha I wasn't having dreams, I was having nightmares. I was having nightmares about the people I had harmed. I couldn't look the world in the eye. When I'd walk down the street, I'd stare down because I was in fear. I was living in fear because I had been dishonest. I didn't clean that mess up. And so therefore, I was terrified people were going to find out that I, I was wherever I was and somehow they were going to get whatever I had um, because I didn't want to own up to it. And so those all got done. But the biggest one was my dad. Um, I'm blessed that I was able to make an amends to my dad. And uh, what I didn't understand about my dad, I had, a, I had a resentment about my dad. And I had harmed my dad in a lot of ways. And um, the way I harmed my dad is I robbed him of happiness and peace of mind. I stole serenity from my father. He was up nights when I was in high school, because I didn't come home nights. And he'd wait up for me, and I wouldn't show. And he was working 12-hour days. And I really made it hard on him. And I couldn't see my part in that. And I had that explained to me. And I flew down to Florida, and I was there for a week. And we, uh, my, dad, my, my parents would not talk to me for the first two years in the program. And then after that, it was very, very uh, superficial. But I was able to build that relationship with my father. And, um, and it was a great relationship. For guys, we actually talked more than just about sports. And, uh, and that meant a lot to me with my dad. And I'm so very blessed that AA gave me the opportunity to do that while he was living. It, it really meant a lot to me. Um, and that was very important to me in my life. Um, what I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is that this is a program where I have to learn how to live sober. And that's what that 10 step is about for me today. It's learning how to live sober. Um, people die, relationships end, people get sick, businesses fail, and can I demonstrate any sense of dignity and grace through all of it? And um, I'm gonna share this, this is gonna be hard. My dad passed away a couple weeks ago, suddenly, unexpectedly. I was the first one in the family to find out. I was actually on the phone with the hospital. My mom got lost going to the hospital, and my brother was not, he was in class. My brother's gone back to school to get a PhD at Syracuse. And um, so I'm on the phone. The nurse says, Gary, we dried everything. We did, your, your father is gone. And so I hung up the phone, and I knew I needed to talk to my wife and my sponsor and my brother the phone rings. It's PJ from Buffalo. PJ starts the phone call by saying, start, I didn't, I said hello, and he goes, Gary, it's PJ. And I pause. He goes, I want to thank you and your wife so much for coming to Buffalo to see me. It really meant a lot for me that you came up to Buffalo and spent time with me, and I was able to introduce you to one of my AA friends, and you were able to spend time at my house and meet my wife. I met PJ in 1995 in Attica State Prison. And PJ went on to say, um, I just want to let you know how much it meant to me that I knew you would be there every month. Because he, did, he was, did about 22 years. And he, it, he just got out about a year ago. And so he goes, how are you? And I go, PJ, my dad just passed. I just found out. He said, well, why don't I just drive to Rochester to be with you? Because you've always been there for me. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> so I tell him I have to make some phone calls. And it's really nice. I put down the phone. I start bawling. <laughs> the phone rings. It's Jim K. Jim goes, PJ just called me. And uh, I'll come right over because uh, I want to be for you. Because I met Jim in Attica State Prison in 1995, and he just got out. And he goes, you were there for us. And that's how alcoholics not us works. That's how it works, is that somehow we are given a gift that we can stay sober and help another alcoholic achieve sobriety, or I can go and do my own thing. You know, I can come into these rooms, stop drinking, and then I just go and do my own thing. I leave the place that gave, my, that gave me my life back. And it's baffling to me. I mean, people get everything back as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
And all of those things take them away from AA. And what I've learned in AA is that when I'm practicing our primary purpose, which is to stay sober and help another alcoholic, I, I'm in very good space. I get out of my head. When I got here this morning and, and I'm part of the committee and um, I was helping set up this morning, I'm counting the coat hangers on the coat rack. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I discover there are more hangers on the right side of the coat racks than on the left sides. <laughs> And then someone in the committee sees me doing this and said, there's some more in the back of the coat room if you'd like to get them and figure that out. And all of a sudden, the tiny voice said, Gary, stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. But then a couple friends of mine showed up in AA, and, um, and everything was better. Everything was better. And, and that's how it works for me in AA. I am just so, so very blessed to have a place that I can go and share my problems, and share my experience, and share a solution, and know that it works. Because I've had that spiritual awakening. I didn't have the spiritual experience that they talk about. I didn't have the Bill's bright white light experience. I had the experience of the huge emotional displacements, and the upheavals, where those old thoughts and ideas get thrown out, and they're replaced by a whole new set of ideas and concepts. And thank God I'm not ignorant anymore. Thank God I didn't dismiss this place without even trying it. You know, change all begins with taking a chance. And I decided to take a chance on the people in these rooms. And these people brought me to God, and God has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I want to thank you.